Hi everyone, this is Zach Moncrief, producer of the series Be Cool Scooby-Doo, and you're listening to a podcast named Scooby-Doo. Yeah! Hey gang, and welcome to another episode of a podcast named Scooby-Doo, the show that attempts to unravel 50 years of mysteries, meddling kids, and masked villains. My name is Mike Josick, and I'll be your guide through all things ghostly and groovy as I investigate every angle of every mystery and beyond. So grab yourself some Scooby snacks, fire up the mystery machine, and let's start the show. Okay, let's do this. Ring. Check. Wait a minute. Objections. Nope. Hold on. This isn't how... Wait, say I do. Scooby, we haven't said our vows. We trust you. But I practiced them all night. This is important to us. Ugh, make it snappy. Hello and welcome to episode 53 of the podcast. If you're a regular listener of the show, I'd like to thank you for hanging in there during the hiatus gaps, and I hope you're all doing well. For anybody who is new to the show and is maybe swinging by because of an interest in my guest, I appreciate you checking the podcast out, and feel free to peruse the back catalog of episodes when you're done with this one, which I think is currently sitting around 75 or 77 other installments on the feed. If this is your first episode, there's still a ton of great Scooby Conversation content available at your fingertips. And speaking of my guest, you probably saw on your way in that on today's show, we have writer Josie Campbell, who is joining me to chat about her time writing for Be Cool Scooby-Doo, her early years as a writer, as well as her work for DC Comics in print and animation. Now, a bit of a caveat before we start. As far as the recording you're about to hear goes, I should qualify that Josie and I did in fact chat back in March of 2023. So anything that we refer to as a new project, like her new Champion of Shazam series or the Legion of Superheroes direct-to-video movie, are, at the time of recording this intro, all things of the past. Thankfully, all the stuff we do talk about isn't really that dated, so it shouldn't be too jarring when we get to those topics. However, I did want to throw in that qualifier just because... This is an older conversation, and some of the things we do discuss may not be current releases or soon-to-be-released things. Since sitting down to chat with me, Josie has continued writing various projects for DC, like the Amazon's Attack miniseries, the Shazam regular monthly title, as well as the tie-in comic book for the My Adventures with Superman animated series, on which she also serves as a writer and executive producer. She's also got a couple more DC direct-to-video films under her belt, so Josie has been very busy in the interim, and all of those projects are definitely worth checking out if you're a fan or just curious to see more from Ms. Campbell. I also want to give a shout-out to the fact that September 13th will mark the 55th anniversary of Scooby-Doo, which debuted on that day back in 1969. I kind of love the fact that the release of this episode is kind of timing out to coincide with that anniversary, so, despite my being on hiatus, I still get to mark the occasion by putting out some Scooby-related material into the world as the IP hits a landmark 55 years. So, without further ado, I will close out this intro and let you all get to my conversation with writer for television, film, and comics, Josie Campbell, and we will see you on the other side. <laughs> My guest today is a Los Angeles-based writer and filmmaker who has contributed to projects for TV, film, and comic books. She was the head writer for hit shows She-Ra and the Princess of Power and Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous, as well as the head writer-producer for the upcoming animated series My Adventures with Superman, hopefully airing on Cartoon Network and HBO Max. Is that is it still a go? It is! It's still okay. a go! We survived! There's so many HBO Max things that we just don't know if they're still going. She was also a contributing writer to Be Cool Scooby-Doo, writing three episodes in season one and I believe one in season two. I'd like you all to please join me in welcoming to the show, Josie Campbell. How are you doing, Josie? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you doing today? Doing all right. I had some computer problems, as you know. For anybody who might yeah. think that's kind of a lackluster intro, I just want to 
let people know because of those computer problems, literally doing it on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> This is live theater now. <laughs> it is. It is. I try to bring a little bit more professionalism to the show, but we're winging it today. But you, you have a background in stand up, so improv is kind of your thing, right? I do. Yeah, yeah. This is. Yeah, I don't know. Like, give me the five minute light, and then I'll know to like shorten my set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, this is this is just bringing me back to my early twenties. <laughs> I'll just like hand it off to you, and then you can hand it back yep. to me. And... Yep. No, it works out. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do a herald in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I did want to start by talking a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what when did the writing bug hit you? What was the inception point for that that brought you on this long journey? <laughs> uh, I mean, the writing bug hit me pretty early on as a kid. Um, it was funny because I was I was a voracious reader. And I would read anything that had, you know, mysteries or superheroes or dragons or fantasy, sci-fi. Um, I was like reading comic books nonstop. I got into my head, I had read like the like autobiography of Jane Goodall and I got into my head, I'm like, I'm gonna be an animal behaviorist. I'm gonna study the squirrels in my backyard. So I had a notebook where I was like, okay, I'm gonna write down my observations. And I found out that that is very boring <laughs> to just stare at squirrels in your backyard. So I started making up stories about them. And I'm like, this squirrel is having a torrid affair with the other squirrel who is king of his own realm. And like, my parents are kind of like, I kind of think maybe you don't wanna observe nature as much as you wanna write stories. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's more fun. Uh, so after that, I, you know, I just, uh, I, I would like write little comic books for myself and my friends. I'd write little short stories. I went to school at Emerson uh, College in Boston for basic, there wasn't a screenwriting major at the time that I went. So I kind of cobbled one together through like writing for TV and film and theater classes and kind of like squish, squish them into like a triple major. But yeah, since I was a little kid who was like obsessed with like, you know, stories, I, I wanted to do this. I need to double back. How old were you when you read the Jane Goodall biography? <laughs> I was like seven or eight. Like I was very young. I was definitely like one of those kids that like, was reading above the grave level, which meant nobody was like monitoring what I was reading. Because like, I also read the Diane Fossey autobiography at that time, and she had a wild life. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, that's great, Josie. Ah, oh, she's reading so much. I'm like sitting over here being like, oh my God, she's dealing with smugglers right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of the same situation for me when I was younger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of it's nice when they're not monitoring you but it, it also sends you into some strange corners sometimes yeah I mean honestly it was the same with the animation too like my parents had the attitude of like anything that's animated is for children which meant when we went to Blockbuster like one of the first things I picked out was the Savage Planet which is this French like <laughs> this new wave animation film that is wild and like nudity is in it and like there's blood and violence and I'm watching this thing and I'm like this is the coolest thing I've ever seen and I cannot let my parents know that I'm definitely not supposed to watch this. So they're like, how is it? I was like, it's good. It's, uh, it's about uh, humans and aliens becoming friends. <laughs> it's great that you're keying into like significant works, like heavy yeah. biographies and and like that's considered <laughs> yeah. that's considered a like classic <laughs> film that's <laughs> yeah it was it was strange yeah because I was just like this looks really cool and they're like yeah sure animation that's for kids yeah so it was like I had that in like the last unicorn on rotation in my house <laughs> <laughs> last unicorn was dark oh man it was it was so beautiful so beautifully animated but yeah so, like the movie is about like learning to regret and death <laughs> And, but like, you know, again, it was like, oh, it's a unicorn. Josie's eight. She'll want to watch this. <laughs> I remember seeing that one in the theater. And oh, it was wow. me. It was me and a friend. We didn't have any parents because, of course, okay. it's a cartoon. So it's yeah. like, yep. Yep. the kids watch the cartoon. Mm -hmm. And I just remember with the bull backing her up on the cliff. And it's just yeah. like, getting intense <laughs> the, yeah the red bull gives you nightmares <laughs> i actually i i met peter beagle a few years ago oh, he was doing a awesome. tour and uh i picked up the book he signed the book for me so mm -hmm. i'm kind of i'm looking forward to that's great to that at some point but oh, that's great <laughs> so 
You go to school for writing. Mm -hmm. We already dropped that you have also some background in sketch comedy, stand-up comedy. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you've also rolled that into animation. So how how do all of those things kind of fold together and fit? What's the uh -huh. Venn diagram there? <laughs> I, I mean, the Venn diagram is kind of all these interests and then me in the middle. <laughs> um, but, you know, honestly, um, and it, you may have heard this from other guests the, there is a kind of weird pipeline from sketch comedy into animation um, in Los Angeles. Like a lot of people I worked with, not just on Be Cool, but like on, you know, like things like the Looney Tunes show, like were sketch comedy people first or were stand ups. You know, I when I was still doing shows at UCB, I would do like, you know, not too shabby or I do like, you know, sketch cram. And like sitting next to me were people who were like working on Teen Titans Go, working on the new Powerpuff Girls. So like it's it's a weirdly like, I, you know, I did sketch comedy because I loved it and I love comedy. But like it, it turned into a weirdly like good group of people to know because like, you know, if you're writing something like a Scooby-Doo where you need to like have somebody who writes good, like a fun story, but also has like a bunch of gag ideas, like you turn to sketch comedians and stand up comedians. Um, I know and... that John had a very specific idea and tone for the show yeah. and specifically sought out yeah. people who could do sketch comedy or stand-up comedy yeah because um, he didn't want that typical kids tv writer yeah yeah not, not to disparage no other yeah, yeah. TV, but, but like, there's, because there's... he had that specific voice yeah. in mind yeah well because like you know and the thing that's been so exciting throughout my career is like watching this real blossoming of like you know there was a point in time where it's like kids animation writing meant like, you know, you do a couple of gags and a very simple thing that's like much more like a preschool bridge show. And that's it. I mean, there's so much more animation happening, even with things shrinking a little bit, there's still so much more animation happening. So yeah, being able to do like a much more comedy focused Scooby Doo, or like being able to work on much more serious action adventure shows, like there's a lot more variety in animation writing and animation than I think there's, there's been in the past, you know, even down to like, I love all the Hanna-Barbera stuff, but like that, that in Looney Tunes was a template for a very long time. And it's been fun to be part of the group that's kind of busting that template and being like, animation can be anything. Are you going to watch it? It'll be anything. <laughs> <laughs> So did you, did you start writing while you were in school as far as like professionally or did you hmm. complete school and then you were looking for jobs? Yeah. And what, so, what would be that first, first job <laughs> for you? So I, my, my route to animation writing is a little circuitous because I went to school, I went to Emerson for writing. Um, Emerson, basically your last semester, in senior year, you have the option to do a study abroad in Los Angeles. Uh, so I did my last semester out here, uh, interned at Dark Horse Entertainment. And the idea is, you know, for and a lot of people do this of, you know, you finish your last semester out here, you've got a, already got an apartment out here, maybe you'll get like a job through your internship, but like you can start the job search right away, and really just sort of catapult yourself into the industry. So I graduated from Emerson, I was moved out here, I got I actually got a job at Warner Brothers doing like putting together content for it was 2008, so they're still trying to figure out how YouTube works. So they're like putting together YouTube web series. Is this a thing? And then the uh, economy around the world crashed. <laughs> and like 800 people, including me, were laid off from Warner Brothers and everything fell apart. And so what I did next was I just took any writing job that would have me, which turned into me ghostwriting for comedians for live award shows and also working as an entertainment journalist for this website called Comic Book Resources. Uh, which when you dropped I the Dark Horse Entertainment, I was like, oh yeah, she wrote for CBR. Yeah, yeah, which is so funny that I, I tell people, you know, I loved comic books. You know, I, I was at the time one of the few people out in Los Angeles when Jonah was kind of, Jonah Wyland, who like owned CBR at the time, was growing it. So I would do, I would cover the press junkets. I would go do interviews with like the directors and movie stars. And then I'd also be the DC beat reporter and just writing about like, what is happening with the, you know, Sinestro Corps war right now? What's happening at the new 52, which was a great job. Like I always joke that like my best job ever was working for a guy named Jonah who would ask me to bring him pictures of Spider-Man. <laughs> I actually applied at CBR, but they wouldn't hire me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Around that yeah. time, I was actually, uh, mm -hmm. I was a features editor for Silver Bullet Comic Books. Oh, nice. Which yeah. you probably know if you worked for CBR. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yep. yeah, I was trying to transition to something mm -hmm. with 
potentially some pay to it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Well, yeah, that's like when I, I have friends who work in comics and they're like, yeah, comics is no pay. I'm like, I used to be a comic book journalist. So I go, oh my God, like I'll buy you a drink. Like, that's, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I did that. So I did that was how I paid the bills for years, but I never stopped writing like I would write an original pilots, I would write sketch comedy, I put on like, you know, a plays with the like Hollywood Fringe Festival, like any venue I could to creatively write, I just kept going at it. Um, and so basically one day about, I guess, like, five years into the four years living to living here, like a friend of mine was working for Alan Burnett at Warner Brothers. And he's like, oh, he's looking for writers. Do you have a sample for like a freelance gig? And so I had just literally just finished a writing sample like the day before. So I sent it off and Alan really liked it. And he brought me in. He did like an interview with me. And then he started sending me as much work as I could handle, basically. Like he had me come in and pitch. There's a lot of pitches that never went anywhere. And ironically, I think the very first thing he had me pitch on was a Scooby-Doo movie DVD that ended up not happening. But yeah, so from there, I, you know, I started working Teen Titans Go freelancing. I started doing, you know, Justice League action. And then, you know, I, I did a, a fun sketch comedy show called Right Now Kapow that was on Disney XD. And then, yeah, and then, you know, Nate uh, Stevenson, who I'd known from from the internet and from comics, was looking to staff up a room for She-Ra and hired me on. And then kind of everything kind of took off from there. <laughs> I love when I look at a writer's IMDb who's coming on the show and you're just going through the list. And you're like, oh, I love that show. I love that show. I love that show. I love that show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been it's been a really fun time. Like I've I've loved even the things that are like just like such a short like one and done assignment. I've loved everything I've worked on. So it's it's been a, it's been lovely, you know. It's it's uh it's it's getting to write my my epic about squirrels but like for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to see that now. <laughs> I definitely had like illustrations too, because I was like into Sailor Moon. So definitely like one of the squirrels <laughs> had the glaive for no reason. <laughs> like it was wild. <laughs> this is a bit of a digression, but I'm kind of curious. How do you get a gig writing jokes for mm -hmm. comedians? So it, it like so many things in Los Angeles, it's just like this weird happenstance of uh, one of my best friends was right, working as an assistant for a live event producer. And his whole gig was like producing things for like, uh, mostly marketing award shows, but like basically the award show circuit, because like every every industry has its own little award shows. So he needed a new joke writer. And it's truly it's the same thing with Alan. She just she's like emailed me. She's like, send me your sketch packet right now. Send me all your send me like a one sheet of jokes. And so I did that and he liked them. So he brought me on. And so yeah, for like two or three, three years, it was just all right, we're doing a sports marketing award show in Portland about like, yeah, sports marketing. We're doing an award show in uh, San Francisco about like video game marketing. There was a lot of marketing stuff and they would hire comedians, but the comedians, you know, don't have their own set about sports media marketing because like it's a wildly specific thing. So I would get hired to write jokes and to write the show in general. I'd write like the hosting bits. Sometimes I write little introductory speeches about what each award is. Um, I would compile this massive script that was just like at each page, just like, okay, here's this award, here's five jokes. Here's this award, here's five jokes. And then when we got closer, they, I would, we'd send it off to the comedian and they'd pick what they liked, they'd rewrite things, they'd cross things out. So it was kind of like giving them uh, and then, you know, they perform it and perform either the jokes I wrote or the jokes that they had sort of rewritten based off of like what I had. But it, that way it made it seem like they had really good jokes for like best pop up display or like number one indie video game of the year when like it's like Amy Schumer, like she does not have a best pop up display <laughs> joke because who would? That's a crazy thing. So, yeah, so just basically, uh, you know, a friend was an assistant and she's she was like, my friend Josie's a really good joke writer. Josie, send me stuff right now, <laughs> like within the hour. <laughs> So are you just very often traveling in the right place at the right time? Or are you aggressive <laughs> with finding new avenues? Because you've also, there's there's kind of a thing where, like, if you write comedy, people tend to think you're the comedy writer. Yeah. Or, you know, if you write animation, you're not a live action writer. Yeah. And, like, yeah. you've done a little bit of everything. You've done yeah. animation. You've done the, the younger animation. You've done older animation. Mm -hmm. You've done comic books. You've done... The joke yeah. writing, like a lot of people don't often have that 
crossover. So yeah. how does that all come your way? Is that you or is that fate? It's, it, it's kind of a little of both. I mean, honestly, a lot of it was, like I said, weirdly enough, graduating into a global recession really shows how much you can stretch. Because <laughs> I was like, you know, like I came out here to write, I wanted to write TV. But I was like, you know, I made a rule for myself. It's like, if it's writing, I'll take the job. I don't want to like, you know, be here and have to do like, even if it's wildly unrelated to TV writing, like if it's writing, I'll take that job. So because of that, I met a lot of people like I met people all over the place. You know, I have friends who work in live action. I have friends who work in comics like, you know, I've got friends from CBR days who are now working over at DC. Like it's so just sort of being open to saying yes to any writing assignment that came my way, no matter how much I would have to like stretch, kind of broadened my horizons and let, let me meet a lot more people than you would if you're like very mono focused on like, I'm only going to do this one thing. And then, you know, the answer that like people don't always love is like, yeah, a lot of entertainment is luck. It's it's this crazy thing of like, you know, you have to have, you know, the ability to capitalize on it. But like, I like it's it's this weird configuration of like there's no way I could have known that me taking a job at CBR while like my husband did like you know my boyfriend at the time did a like Tumblr blog where then I talked to Nate and Nate knew me because he knew my husband from like the internet like who in 2011 like I didn't know that this would lead to Nate calling me up and being like hey do you want to like write Shira with me. I just was open to the experience. I was just like, yeah, uh, let's do it. So I would say, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a very weird winding path, but like, I would say to anybody who like wants to work in animation or in entertainment, like say yes to things, even if, even if you're not qualified, even if you have to stretch, <laughs> like figure out what it is that you love. And I loved writing and just say yes to things. Cause that opens so many more doors and you never know what thing is going to lead to that like lucky strike, your, your big break, you know? So you weren't like, you didn't throw the hobo stick over your shoulder and <laughs> head off to Hollywood being like, I'm going to be an animation writer. You are just like, <laughs> I just want to write. Yeah. Yeah. I knew TV and like, I loved animation. Um, but like, yeah, I wanted to write and you know, it, it, it's it's worked out because I mean, I love animation writing and I love what I do. But like, if if you were to like ask me at like 21 years old of like exactly what career path I'd be like, well, I want to write, I'd like it to be on TV. That's the extent I sort of know. And then yeah, it, it all you know, I like tell this to like people and like my friends and family are like, Josie, you were watching like Avatar, like constantly and rewatching like Cowboy Beep. You obviously you wanted to work in animation. I'm like, yeah, it would have been nice, but I didn't have the expectation. <laughs> I've had other guests on who have talked about just that process of you take this job or you take that job because at those jobs, you're making those connections that help you move through the different mm -hmm. genres or mediums or whatever. And like, as I'm listening to you, it's it's making sense. Like, you know, working at CBR, you're building relationships, you're networking. Mm -hmm. You probably know people at DC Comics. You probably, you know, your name is in people's minds. Yeah. Same thing with like taking whatever random writing job. You're meeting people. Like yeah. that's, yeah. a lot of people think networking is just like going to parties or just, yeah. you know, being in the right place or whatever. And it's yeah. like, no, you network while you're working too. Yeah. And you know, so much of like, it's, it is always weird. Cause it's like, I get why it gets like funneled into this, like, oh, you're networking, you're networking. But like the real answer is like, I made friends. This is happening. Not because like, you know, I did the right thing at the right mixer. It's happening because my like, you know, I met somebody at a job who turned out to be like one of my good friends. And like, when she got an opportunity, she like nominated me to write these jokes or like, you know, I had friends I went to college with. Who we all did sketch comedy together and stand up. And so when one of them got an opportunity, they're like, we know a couple of other writers who'd be good too. And it's 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 a really lovely thing. I think people, it, it, movies a little bit more like this, but like people think of entertainment in Hollywood as very cutthroat, but like it's a, it's a collaborative industry, especially animation. You literally need like a team of like a hundred people to make this show. So like, you know, everybody wants to be the person who like knows a good writer or a good artist like everybody is trying to help each other out like it's a lot more altruistic a lot more like kind than I think a lot of people really think of when they think Hollywood you need the talent to back it up but do not underestimate nepotism <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I'm not I'm not directing movies right now. My yeah, my my parents' storied careers as uh, civil servants in DC were not helping like originally, but <laughs> so how were you how were you picked up for Be Cool? Um was it Zach? Was it John? Were you found in the sketch comedy circuit? <laughs> were you in the in animation circles already? Because like yeah. you said, you had worked on Justice League Action and yeah, so oh, I was net. I was in animation circles already. Um, I had been doing a ton of freelance at Warner Brothers, a ton of pitching at Warner Brothers. And also, um, John was working with uh, my husband over there at the time, or my, my he was a, a friend at the time, and also uh, Michael Jelinek, who had used some of my scripts for like Teen Titans Go. So he had like my name with like a couple of other of our friends. So and he... Just for anybody who doesn't know, Michael Jelinek was one of the producers on Be Cool. yeah. So basically, like, between Michael and Marley and me being at Warner Brothers, like, you know, I sent in a sample and John and them and John and Zach really liked it. Um, and so they brought me in. Um, There's actually we did a, like almost like a mini writers room day where they brought me in and a couple of other writers like Justin uh, Becker, Steve Clemens. I, I can't remember if Ben Joseph was part of that group or not. And we like pitched ideas for like what would be not just fun Scooby Doo like villains and fun Scooby Doo plots, but like what things would be like really funny to like subvert a little bit, or like what things would be like really funny to see, you know, that like we felt like maybe hadn't been seen before. What like big like Scooby stuff do we want to bring back? And from there, we came up with a bunch of premises that then sort of John sort of assigned out to us. Um, and we started, it, because it was a freelance show, there was no writer's room, we started writing. So, you know, it was it was really fun. Cause like, you know, we, it was like just a bunch of people who like, like Scooby-Doo and like telling jokes in a room being like, oh, we gotta use, like what, could, could we use the creeper again? Could we use it like, but like how to, what if, what if we do like a, 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 a one where the clue is like different allergic reactions that Daph Velma's having to hey, like it was just like a really fun time. I mentioned earlier that when, when John was looking for writers, he had a very specific voice in mind for the comedy. There was a certain speed of how that comedy would be delivered. Mm -hmm. But um, what was kind of the brief to the freelancers? Because in, in speaking with John, he has mentioned that with some of the freelancers, at least, it did take a little bit of coaching to kind of mm. like get them. Yeah. Well, laser focus them into what that voice sort of was. So, well, yeah, because it's, it's, you know, as when you freelance on a show, it's it's so much more work for the people working on the show. And it's so much work for you as a freelancer, because you know, on a regular show, like she or Jurassic or the other things I've done, I've had a writer's room. So together, we all figure out, well, here's what the tone is. Everybody like, you know, if somebody goes off, we can like sort of course correct. But like when you're a freelancer, you say like, here's this premise and they go, great, go write it. <laughs> like there's, there's, uh, there's not really a room. There's not really that guidance there. And you know, that's what John, I think was trying to do with that very first sort of like season one, like sort of day, day and a half that we did to at least like try to get everybody aligned. But like, yeah, it's freelancing is is very hard. Freelancing is extremely hard for a half hour show. Freelancing works a lot better on like an 11 minute show, something where there's a lot more gags, something where like you can sort of, it's easier to rewrite. But like doing a half hour show where there's gags, where there's a haircut, where there's a big musical chase scene. And then also the clues kind of have to make sense is a lot of work. <laughs> and the worst part is you always get notes on the clues because they're like, oh, we've seen we've seen footprints before. Could it be something else? You're like, well, now I have to rewrite the whole second act because <laughs> they have to find a clue. So, yeah, so it's it's a lot of hard work. But, you know, John shared with us, you know, like he had put together sort of a mood board almost of, you know, here's young Frankenstein. Here's some of the jokes we kind of like um, to try to like steer us in the right direction. But after that, yeah, it was like writing and then seeing what stuck to the wall and being like, all right, uh, is this? Yeah. OK, you like this. Great, great, great. I'll get another script. Let's <laughs> let's keep going. Hearing John say that he had Gene Wilder in mind for Fred, like, that just made so much sense after yeah. the fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so would you say that 
you know, you refer to yourselves as freelancers and mm -hmm. there was that little summit, mm -hmm. not necessarily yes. like a writer's room. No, but um, like with would you, like align ideas, yeah. <laughs> knowing a little bit about kind of how mm -hmm. things were sort of set up in production and, and what Warner's sort of wanted and didn't mm -hmm. want to sort of mm -hmm. be going on, kind of dancing around this. Would you say that you were all kind of officially freelancers, both in title and deed, or you were sort mm. of freelancers in title, but m a little bit more kind of series writers as no. far as... Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you know, it's it's what you do when you are when you have to produce a show with, like, that's only freelance budget. Like, ba basically, you know, like, I kept writing scripts because, like, I got the tone that John wanted. Like, everybody who kept writing scripts or got more than one script, it's because, like, John was like, yes, like, our visions align, we gel, I totally get this. So like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's an industry animation wide problem that like, you know, I was part of the animation uh, guilds uh, negotiation committee when we were doing the like hashtag, like new deal for animation and pay animation writers, where a lot of studios would like to be able to essentially as much as possible eliminate the writing portion of it. Like they would really prefer it if they just had to pay underpay a board artist to do everything. So like a lot of studios have really pushed the like, okay, this will be all freelance. But like, like I said, it's it's really hard to do when you have a, a real story, when you have half an hour to fill. So, you know, our title was freelancers, but like in actuality, like we were basically the writing staff. We were the ones like steering the ship. We were the ones getting like all the scripts. Like John was doing a, a ton of work to like, you know, keep keep the 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 train on the rails. But the the reason, you know, a show like that works is because you find the freelancers who get it. And then you give them the same scripts over and over. It, it's sort of the same thing with like Teen Titans Go. Like I have a pal there, Steve Borst, who's talked about it, where he was like the freelancer. But like every season, he had a ton of scripts. Like he eventually did become a staff writer and they they opened it up. But it's uh, the, the idea that you can run an entire show off an entirely freelance group only works if you've got a very strong person at the head and you've got some really good freelancers. And it's definitely something that I think a lot of writers have spoken out about wanting to change in our industry. And, you know, it's something that, like, I've had the ability to be part of that change, you know? Like, Shira, we're like, we have a writer's room. Jurassic, we have a writer's room. Superman, we have a writer's room. So it, it's this weird thing of, like, I, I, I might not be dancing around as much as John would like me to, but, like, because so much of what I've done over the past three years was helping, you know, get ready for those like negotiations. It's something I feel really strongly about that, like, if you want good animation, you need to hire people. You need to, you can't just be like, okay, like, here's like 20 names we've pulled out. Like, maybe some of them will work and then you have to rewrite everything. Like, it's it's the same thing of like, there was a while where they were trying to like freelance out a lot more boards. And it's it's the same thing of just like, what works, we're, we're, we're a creative medium, we're artists, we work best when we're working with each other when we know what the show is about, when we're able to like course correct in person rather than sitting around for like weeks and weeks and waiting for an email with notes that we don't quite understand because we were never part of the process. So I guess this is this is my like statement of like, <laughs> keep on making sure that writers get paid and keep on making sure that, you know, even with freelance work, like it is work, it is, you are essentially the staff of the show. And the more studios should be, uh, should be fronting the ability to have a writer's room. I remember during that whole New Deal for Animation period, uh, a lot of the discussion, you mentioned the, you know, just let the storyboard artists do it. And there's the storyboard artists, but then there's also the storyboard revisionists. Yeah. And so much work was being yeah. shunted to the revisionists where they were yeah. like redoing entire sequences sometimes and stuff. And it's like just yeah. not their job. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's like, it, it's physically draining, like, you know, writing is a hard mental job. But like, you know, I have a lot of friends who have, you know, they draw with braces, like it is a job that takes a toll on your body. And I, I think people don't think about that. Like you think Hollywood, or you think entertainment or TV, and you're thinking movie stars, or you're thinking TV stars, but like the people making the things are physically doing stuff, they're physically doing things every day. So yeah, no, as you know, as much as possible, like pay up animation, pay up like uh, animation writers, new deal for animation, we got a lot of gains in that contract. But like, we definitely all recognize the, the 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 battles won, but the war keeps going. Uh, we're like people are still we're still going to be trying to make sure that animation is a good job and a good career and a good place like moving forward. So 
I guess this is like turning into like a campaign speech. I swear to God. Hey, no problem. If, if we want to throw in some manifestos here, I'm oh my perfectly God. fine yeah, with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like I said to you off air, I mean, for me, you know, the focus is kind of Scooby-Doo. It's mm-hmm. kind of creating that oral history of Scooby, yeah. but animation as a whole, as an industry in general, yeah. um, is of interest to me. And it is discussions that should yeah. be happening and should be getting signal boosted. And, you know, yeah. people who watch animation need, I think they need to know wow. how these things get made and how people are treated, <laughs> making the things that they love because it's the audience they they play a part in changing, swaying the minds of the corporations that are responsible for financing these things. Yeah. And oh yeah, absolutely. Making the rules. So yeah, I'm perfectly fine talking <laughs> as long as you want about. <laughs> New Deal you need animation. politics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so. I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of mm. writing the episodes mm. because yeah. you said you had like the day and a half in the room where you sort yeah. of broke down some premises and stuff got assigned and then mm-hmm. sort of where that goes. First off, you're obviously all kind of workshopping and brainstorming. So how much pitching and how much is being given out by John? And also once that process is kind of done mm-hmm. and you all go off to write the process of writing the episodes and what the kind of like revision process and mm-hmm. how much is kind of getting to screen. And then also finally uh, seeing the final product compared to everything else, every step yeah. on that process and how how that works and how yeah. you feel about that. That's an extremely large <laughs> question. No, it's, it's, so, it's, it's fun. I'll just go to the bathroom and let you talk. <laughs> Great. You're going to come back and I'm like, no gods, no masters, the unions. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and you know, I think John for, for season two changed it a little bit, but yeah, because we had that little mini room, we had come up with a ton of premises and ideas or like ghosts and ghouls and like fake uh, monsters that we wanted to see. So it was a little easier than um, a freelance script would normally go, which is like John was like, okay, like, uh, you know, we had, we'd let him know what things we were interested in. He's like, okay, like, uh, you know, you wanted to do like the, you know, the Norse Vikings, you wanted to do the this, you want to do the that. Um, so because we had broken a lot of those premises together, we knew the idea. And then from there, the writing is like a pretty, a pretty standard process where, you know, we had the premise we would write up a outline of like the episode uh, along with, you know, we would talk maybe sometimes a little bit to John about like what we would thought the haircut would be or what we thought the fun, uh, you know, musical like chase would be. And so we would put together like an outline that then we we would send off to the executives to approve and give us notes on. And then from there, we would launch right into script. We'd start writing right away. And then you, you'd you get notes from John and you'd get notes from the uh, executives on, you know, your first draft, your second draft, and then you do like a polished draft. Uh, and so it's a pretty standard process. But like, you know, like I said, because it was Scooby, it was so, sort of funny because it was the notes would be like, you know, sometimes it makes sense to be like, oh, we need to punch up this scene or we need to like add some more jokes for the Daphne stuff. And yeah, sometimes it would be like, okay, I don't think this clue works, which means that it's a lot more work on our end and a lot more work on John's end to kind of like tear it apart and be like, okay, well, we had to go around the barn to find the footprints to lead them to where the manufacturing equipment is hidden. So where do we go now? And It's a struggle because not only are you doing a comedy show and you have to work out the timing and the comedy beats and whether the jokes are working, but you also have a mystery you have to service, which has to have functional clues. Yes. structure and arcs and yeah, yeah you have to you have to meet like at least two to three like suspects maybe more depending on what the episode is it's uh it, everybody has to have their own gag um it is though even with that being hard like the, the fun thing was writing scooby you know like the uh the voice that we had for scooby and shaggy was so fun the voice that we found for like daphne and fred and velma was so fun i i, I also got uh the privilege in season two to like co-write I think two scripts with my I can't I like I'm like trying to like remember so like I've said husband fiance boyfriend so we were boyfriend it's and girlfriend <laughs> then so on season two we had gotten engaged to get married which is fun because then we wrote the uh, I Scooby Do the like wedding themed <laughs> episode together because John was like well you, you guys are getting married we're like yeah we're getting married this would be fun so, and then we wrote the like Norse case scenario script together so like season one was a little bit more sort of me off my own and season two Marley and I got to collaborate which was a lot of fun uh, both because we could 
funnel in every weird superstition we learned about like weddings into one episode. But it was like fun to have somebody to be able to bounce ideas off of of being like, okay, what if they set up this elaborate trap and then they realize that the ghost coming from them from behind and they set up the trap wrong. Like, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it was, it was really, really fun and fun to work on. Was that more of a production thing mm. or a creative thing where bringing in Marley as a, as a co-writer, because mm. two uh, writers can write faster than one. Yeah. Or is, it like, <laughs> or is it just, Hey, you know, we can really bounce stuff off of each other. Yeah. And we've got a really good chemistry. Yeah. It was like, it was, I think it was both? a lot more, yeah, I can, <laughs> it, you know, it was a lot more, I think creative. Um, but like, you know, at that point, Marley was like on staff at Warner brothers and like, you know, he was like working with Michael, he was working with a uh, John. Um, he was, he was helping do a lot of these rewrites. Um, so, uh, some of it was, he was there already working on it already on staff. And then some of it was, yeah, creatively we're like, you know, we had written sketch comedy be- together before we had done little like comedy bits before. So like, oh yeah, it makes, it just makes a lot of sense. So yeah, season one, we had that sort of little summit. We got a lot of the premises off of that. Uh, we set to writing, uh, and got like, I got like a, a couple of different scripts and then yeah, season two, I co wrote those two things with Marley and it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I like the show a lot. I really like how it came out. Kate Micucci does a great job as Velma. Like, it's just like such a good group of people. It's really, really fun. <laughs> there was a lot of controversy when Kate took over because of the whole transfer of power, I guess, yeah, for lack of a better word. Yeah. <laughs> you had uh, Mindy Cohn for so long, yeah, but yeah. Kate is just such a great Velma and fits the tone of that show yeah, so well. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was it was really, really fun. It was like a, it was just like a, a good time overall. So it was, you know, I really liked that that got to be my Scooby Doo. <laughs> I will say I, or I should say that two of my favorite lines from the show do come from two of your episodes. <laughs> yeah, um, I love when in uh, I Scooby Dooby Doo where somebody is like, why does why is Scooby officiating? And he's like, I'm ordained. <laughs> And then in the uh, in the Norse case scenario, I can't tell you how many times, and I don't know who's responsible for these jokes. Uh-huh. I know there's a lot of hands that go in there, so these may not actually be yours. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the first one was definitely ours. So excellent, yeah, yeah. excellent. But yeah. then the other one was where Daphne says that my mother always said that the outdoors is just the bathroom that wants to kill you. <laughs> like a combo of us and John I mean the one that <laughs> the one that I really love that we came up with Marley and I that was just like it's like we're in forest jail and we're 18 so we're going to be tried as forest adults <laughs> those are the things I actually uh I watched those two episodes specifically uh in my little kind of research watch and it was interesting seeing just the pacing of the two because mm-hmm. I Scooby Dooby Do has a much more deliberate yeah uh dialogue kind of maybe action mm-hmm. i'm trying yeah, to think of how to describe that but like uh-huh. north case scenario was just punchy it was like yeah yeah one after the other it was just coming like yeah nobody's well, business it, and like all mm-hmm. of them were just golden <laughs> yeah well because you know that's the fun part and like I, I remember when i first started i had to explain to my parents because they're like oh well so you write the words that the actors say and then the artists write everything else i'm like no i write everything like you know we're writing like you know the scene descriptions we're writing the haircuts we're writing like so like you know yeah the wedding one was a little bit more like wordplay and then the norse case scenario you're like as many jokes as possible. Gags, gags, gags. Let's get through. The, also, uh, I will say one of my favorite punch ups I've seen on one of my scripts is like at the very end, John just having the bear scream bear, <laughs> like I Scooby Dooby bear. Because like, I think we we had the bear talking and he's like, it just says bear. We're like, yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> that was such a great moment too, where Shaggy's like, I wonder if we can eat these. And Scooby's like, let's ask the bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, that's, that's, again, that's the, the fun of, you know, we, we got as close as we possibly could on a freelance show to being able to like bounce ideas off of each other. And that's the fun that comes out of it. <laughs> so was there, I'm kind of revisiting the previous question, I mm-hmm. guess, a little bit just to get a little bit more clarification. Mm-hmm. Was there much communication between the writers, or at least, you know, you and maybe Marley, just because mm-hmm. you can kind of maybe speak for yourself more mm-hmm. than anybody else and, and the rest of the production mm-hmm. or 
or did you mostly kind of disappear and then just get the notes and respond and things were just moving back and forth? Yeah. So, I mean, um, our, you know, our point person and the writing side was John. So the, you know, John, sometimes Zach, but John was the one who was like, you know, taking us through the notes. He was the one sort of, you know, he, he was basically working as the head writer, like producer of the show along with Zach. So I, unfortunately, because it was freelance and we weren't in the office um, and we were just script by script, uh, I, I didn't get to meet the directors. Um, I didn't get to meet the board artists. Marley did because he was on staff. And so like, you know, he did a lot of work like sitting up in the edit bay or a lot of work helping out with sort of like rewrites on the fly. But yeah, when you're when you're freelancing on a show, you know, you get brought in to like interact with the producers, you get brought in to interact with the executives, you're interacting with whoever is like the head writer a ton, like back and forth, you get ideas. But yeah, the artists were kind of like, they came on later. We wrote first, the artists came on later. So I unfortunately on that show never got to really hang out with or meet the artists, which is so funny because like later on in other shows I've worked on, where, you know, I've had a little bit more control. So we have been able to have the writers and artists meet. I've, I met artists who are like, oh, yeah, I worked on your script. I was like, what? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I remember that one. It's not Scooby-Doo, but on, you know, My Adventure of Superman, I was working with my friend Brendan, uh, who's the co-EP, and we realized that, like, he was the one who would do all of the boards for the Superman like shorts I would do on Justice League action. <laughs> so we're like, oh, this is our second collaboration. So yeah, very little to do with the actual artists or production, but like a lot to do with, you know, John uh, interacting with him a lot, interacting with the executives over there, interacting with Zach, just very much more kind of, they're almost like their own little fiefdoms when you're on a freelance show of like, here's the writers, here's the artist, and then here's the people in the middle kind of like making this all happen. I've heard a lot of arguments from people who work on productions where they're like, do not keep the artists and the writers in different buildings. Like it is a <laughs> yeah. cross pollinate those two departments oh, is invaluable. Yeah. yeah. And, and some studios are just like, yeah, the this group is way across town and the yeah. Twains never meet. And yeah, it's yeah. always seemed kind of nuts to me. So did you get to meet like the voice cast or anything? Were you part of any records or was that primarily John? So I wasn't part of any records. That was that was John. Um, again, like it's been funny of like meeting people later on when I'm doing records or doing auditions for things or they're like, I was on a thing you wrote. And I was like, oh, <laughs> amazing. But yeah, no, that was that was John. Sometimes Marley would help out with that. But that was primarily John getting to getting to have fun with like... <laughs> The voice cast. <laughs> I know Tom Conkle, I believe it was the Norse case scenario episode. Mm -hmm. He did a voice for one of the characters. Mm -hmm. Now I know Tom is also an actor as well as a writer. Did you guys get to do anything like that? Mm. Do you have any voices um, in any? <laughs> we do not because we, I don't have a SAG card and Warner ah. Brothers <laughs> won't let you do a voice unless you're part of SAG. So that, uh, alas, uh, no voices. Although we did um, the uh, Ice Cube Dooby Do. Nat and Kimmy, those names. So, like, I have friends whose nickname for me was Cammy, for uh, and that Nathaniel's Marley's middle name. So we kind of named them after ourselves, and kind of were like, if you, if you like, slip it to the artist. If you know, here's a picture of us. If you want to make it look like us, <laughs> eh, we won't say no. <laughs> That's as close as we got to maybe being able to voice a character. <laughs> So that episode, I Scooby Dooby Doo, in particular, was one that you were channeling kind of a lot of personal experience yeah. into. I'm curious what the experience writing that was compared to some of the other episodes, since it was yeah. kind of so close to your your heart, so to speak. Yeah, it's so it was so funny because like you know because we're like oh it'd be really funny like it started as a joke where like it'd be really funny if we wrote that episode and then we're like whoa we should write that episode because uh, you were actually planning your wedding at the time yeah, right? yeah yeah planning the wedding at the time. So it was, it was this funny thing of just like, like maybe it was like too close to home of just we're like, you know, something would happen and be like, this would be really funny in the script. <laughs> Please but tell like, me that the best man started his speech with like. <laughs> we, uh, I loved it. So the best man speech thing, we actually did have a friend and it wasn't his like, it wasn't the best man speech. It was his vows that like he like put it off the last possible second we're like dude you have to write your vows <laughs> like she's got them ready to go you have to have yours so it was like a little bit like that and then honestly a lot of it was us noticing like every single superstition of a wedding going well 
is a just utter disaster. They're like, find spiders in your shoes. Like it's a good wedding. If it rains, it's a good wedding. If like a meteor hits you, it's a good, you're like, what is what like it's like oh these are clearly things to like come a jittery groom and bride but we just thought it was so funny to put that in but were there then, more of those in because that was that, a ton <laughs> i got the sense that because they do have that moment at the end where it's like this is a superstition or whatever and he's like well you should you can't just make up superstitions and i kind of felt like there was maybe a runner there that didn't get developed enough or mm. that there wasn't time for so yeah hearing so, you talk about this i'm like oh was there yeah. more <laughs> yeah, we had we had a lot of things. And you know, because with Scooby Doo, because the gang is the focus, like we had a bunch of stuff for the bride and groom, but like yeah, it does get it gets like, you know, in our even our second draft, we're like, uh, a lot of the stuff has to go because we have to, you know, focus on the mains. So like, you know, the things that we really ended up focusing on was like, you know, Sco- like the the best man speech really thought it was funny for Scooby to be the officiant. <laughs> uh, we really, really had a fun time. And like, it wasn't wedding. It was slightly wedding related. We're like, okay, what if Velma like has like, has like never worn high heels before, but somehow, somehow she's the best at wearing high heels. So like, it was a lot of coming up with gags and things like that. Um, and as, as the script went, it got a little further away from like, here's exactly a wedding thing to, you know, here's, you know, the fun we're going to have, the gags we're going to have with the gang. But yeah, we had like, we had like a day of just like pages of here's every superstition we can think of. Here's everything that could go wrong at a wedding. Here's like the guest book stuff. Um, And then I think it came together to be like a really fun episode, even though not everything got to get in at the very last minute. And am I mistaken or have you written the only haircut gag that doesn't feature Shaggy and Scooby? Oh yeah, <laughs> which is like so funny to me. I didn't even think about that, but yeah, yeah. Literally, as I was watching hair. it, I'm watching yeah. that sequence yeah. with Daphne with the hair and yep. Velma trying to yep. keep the cliff right out, and I was like, "Is this the yeah. haircut gag?" Yeah, yeah. Because I was like, "Yeah, it's it's you no, know, you're right. I actually didn't think about that. Yeah, no, for sure that they're the ones. Well, because it's like in some ways, like Daphne gets to be Shaggy and Velma gets to be Scooby this episode. So yeah, like you know, Velma's chomp clomping around and saving people from cliffs but yeah yeah the two of them doing that hair the uh the that the haircut was really really fun and yeah that is different than i think a lot of the stuff we had been doing before we're like you know the like scooby snack factory episode like has a very classic haircut like in a much more classic scooby setup although that was another one that i got to pull from life because i had done a interview when i was with cbr um with when the Muppet movie came out with one of the Muppeteers for the uh, one of the new Muppets. And I went into the room and the PR person's like, okay, you're going to be talking to the puppet. I'm like, oh, oh no, I thought this was an interview with the puppeteer. They're like, no, the puppeteer is going to pretend like he doesn't exist. You have to talk to the puppet. I was like, what? So like that whole sequence of like Velma being like, I'm talking to you. The human man is like ripped from my life where I'm like, so what's it like being working as a like Muppeteer? And the puppet would go, who are you talking to? It's just me. <laughs> it's, it's so Velma to not just play along with the artifice of it. Like she'd yeah. just be like, no. No, you are a human. I'm talking to you. Yeah, I literally see you right now. Stop <laughs> it. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me, human man. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up with the titles. Mm-hmm. I Scooby Dooby Doo sort of seems to just be a given. Yeah. Um, Norse case scenario, clever, but a little clumsy. Um, <laughs> I'm kind of wondering when like you're getting roasted here. <laughs> <laughs> When you're coming up with the Mm -hmm. episodes, the premises, Mm -hmm. are the titles kind of an afterthought and not in the sense where you're just like dismissing it, but like it's, it's the end of the process or is the title something that you zero in on earlier and like how many options did you come up with? Like did you have to (laughs) narrow it down? Yeah. So, I mean, with Be Cool, there were a lot of puns as titles. So, I mean, you know, it's as, as writers, like we came up with a title, like, but, you know, in animation, you don't really finalize that title until like you're getting closer to post um, because then you actually have to have the credits. So, yeah. So, you know, we came up with, you know, Norse case scenario. We came up with I Scooby Dooby Doo. There's like a couple of others that I can't remember that we came up with. But then, you know, if John would change it or like re- rewrite something or come up with a different a different pun usually. So, yeah, it was just like, you know, you'd write you'd write a, a script title and then. Uh, whether or not it made it through was just like, did it tickle John's funny bone? 
Did you find that the the process of breaking the stuff down in that day and a half, and I guess just kind of the vibe carrying on from there, was it a, a generous sort of writing experience? Mm-hmm. Like, was the creativity was flowing back and yeah. forth between everybody? It wasn't kind of like, you know, it's my idea, I'm doing this and no, being no. protective of stuff? No, I mean, you know, and again, I think, it, you know, it's a myth that pops up a lot. It, it was definitely generous. Like every joke, even if you throw out a joke, like somebody like, you know, what pluses it or adds on to it, you riff back and forth. Like, at, you know, part of the point of that was like getting to that space where it's like we could like make a joke and somebody could make a better joke and then you riff off of that joke so like the best writing gigs and the best writers rooms are the ones where you're riffing back and forth and nobody is protective of their joke uh there's a a term in tv writing that live action people say and animation people say too is don't be a stop sign and so what that means is you don't be so protective of your idea and don't say no to things because then that like you know it kind of kills the mood it drags the whole room down like being creative it's a it's an experience where you're kind of looking to the people around you to plus it to end it to like add something to it and if you're a stop sign if you're like well that's not my idea or like that's not what i want to do you're not really being part of that process so like you know some of the best shows i've worked on are ones where like you know somebody would be like i love this line or i love this joke where did this come from and it's like well some of this came from me as the writer but then some of this was like we would do punch-ups in the room for she-ra we would do like you know punch-ups in the room for superman which is still coming out and like you know i'd be like yeah you know it started as one person joke and then we added to it and then we like workshopped it and we did this and by the end It's why when you have a writer's room, you have every single person listed in those credits because everybody really is helping each other out and everybody really is working together. So I would say that that group in that time was like a very generous room and a very fun room, uh, even though it was so short to be a part of. I kind of felt that uh, with your four episodes, out of all the characters, Fred was probably the least serviced. Mm-hmm. Velma and Daphne and Shaggy and Scooby seem to have a lot of like mm-hmm. really classic stuff going yeah. on. Is it safe to say those are your favorite characters and your favorites <laughs> to write for? I mean, God, writing for Shaggy and Scooby is an absolute dream. And like, you know, John had such a clear vision of like Daphne's going to have a thing every single time. Um, and you could hear Kate's voice. And I mean, also some of it is just like we knew going into each script of like there's going to be some scripts where some characters are serviced more than others. So I I ended up having scripts or other than I think the... Um, scarecrow scare where like fred is like stupidly in love with beth even and like but then is insisting on arresting her like her uh her father at the end <laughs> uh that was a fred focused one but like we would when we were doing the assignments like you know john would be like oh this is a little bit more scooby or like you know we'd be like it's a little bit more daphne a little bit more velma and you know the nice thing about having so many episodes in season one and season two unlike now where you get like only eight episodes or only six episodes was that it meant that even if one script or one episode didn't have a ton of Fred, the next one could. Um, and, you know, that's that's sort of the idea, too, of just like not every episode will focus on the characters equally. Like we, we really were trying to like be like, OK, like who's sort of driving the jokes in this one more than almost anybody else? We um, see that a lot in, in most ensemble television where... Yeah especially with the series starting out, if you've got five main cast members, you know, you've got your pilot and then you're like, oh, this second episode is focusing on this character. Yeah, That's yeah, theirs. exactly. And then the next episode is like yep. the next character because you're yeah. introducing them as you go. Yeah. And then, you know, like it, it, it is like, you know, as you're writing, like you ep- individual episodes aren't, you're writing your own individual episode, but whoever is running the show like sees the whole. So they know like, oh, we need to dive deeper into this one character now, or we need to like pull back on this character because the very next episode is going to be much more about them. So yeah. So, you know, I wrote episodes that tended to be a little bit more Daphne and Velma focused or tended to be a little bit more Scooby and Shaggy focused. But, you know, I, I had um, other friends who were writing episodes that were a lot more Fred focused. So it was just kind of like a, not every episode is going to have every single cast member equally and then, yeah, John is the one and Zach are the ones sort of like seeing the whole thing and being like, okay, cool, you'll do this episode, you'll do this episode, this will be the focus, et cetera, et cetera. I'm a big fan of, especially with franchises like this, where it's been going on for so long mm-hmm. and they're fairly elastic. I like to see them evolve and I like to see them try new things. I love mm-hmm. the the tropes and the formulas and stuff. Yeah. But hearing you say, you know, about focusing on Nate and Kimmy and how 
there was kind of a danger of focusing on them too much and, and yeah. maybe ignoring some of the cast. Yeah. I'm kind of intrigued by the idea if that episode did focus more on them because they were mm. supposed to be such old friends, good friends. Yeah, yeah. And it just would have changed the <laughs> dynamic a little bit. Yeah, of yeah. The show and playing with that a little bit. I know that had the show continued, both Zach and John have spoken about playing a little bit more with format yeah, and not necessarily yeah. like playing with those, uh, you know, like mythology episodes where it's a yeah. Greek episode or it's a Dickens <laughs> yeah, episode yeah. or whatever. So I feel like that might have been explored more kind of moving mm-hmm. on. But Yeah, um, I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things of like, it's also, you know, when we were working on it, like Mystery Inc. Had, had come out right before us, which was a lot more character and serialized focus. So it was also very much, you know, the notes we were getting from like Warner Brothers and like a, like top down were a lot more like, well, let's let's do something a little more sort of like focused on the fun with Scooby, uh, which sort of gelled with a, a lot of the things that John and Zach did. But yeah, I mean, the thing, like you said, that the franchise is so old, there's so many different incarnations of like, whatever Scooby you want, you've got. Like I grew up on like a pup named Scooby-Doo and that was my foray into it. I was like, this is great. Red herring, what a what a concept. And then, yeah, and then I got into like old Scooby-Doo. But like, yeah, the fact that you've got, you know, you've got Be Cool, which is like very comedy focused. Like we do it a lot of classic things. You had Mystery Inc., which is a lot more serialized before I think they quite knew exactly what to do with the idea of a serialized show. You've got Pup named Scooby-Doo. You have like, you know, Scooby-Doo the Scooby specials you've got like you know zombie islands there's so many different things and the puppet one (laughs) and the puppet one (laughs) yeah it's it's great so it's like it's one of those things that like even if like maybe a specific episode or specific series is like you're like I don't know about that it's like because the the gang is always there and there's the there's always a mystery to solve like there's just so many different ways to play with it and take it now there were some there was some <laughs> behind the scenes stuff going on, particularly in season two. I'm curious because you have episodes in both seasons. Did the processor experience change at all for you, or were you insulated from everything? Yeah, because I think I um, and I would I would actually have to look to see. I can't remember if I did only two episodes in season two or three, but like because we didn't do the like room again, and then because I was just writing, I kind of didn't know what was going on on the production side. So and especially like right after that was like you know I started writing out Kapow. So, you know, I, you know, heard a little bit from like John, but yeah, for the most part, because writing was siloed off, I didn't really know anything that was going on. Again, years later, I'd meet people who'd be like, oh, I had a fun time working on this one. I was like, really? You worked on that too? So. You obviously, you were a fan of Scooby-Doo. You originally, your first Warner Brothers gig was pitching a Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Um, what was it about Be Cool in specific? I mean, obviously there's the Scooby-Doo attraction. Yeah. Was that just another job that you said yes to? Or was there something specific about Be Cool that you were like, this, this I want to be a part of? I mean, you know, like I said, the the being open to opportunities was also the saying yes to things that seem cool. Like it was as much about like not holding yourself back as it was being like, say yes to things. But yeah, Scooby is great. Like it was it was like I knew a lot of the people who were going to be writing on it, the, 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 the ensemble. I'd written stuff for like Michael before, like it. It was just seemed really fun. It seems like they're like, we're going to do something that's a little bit more sketch comedy, a little bit more comedy based. Here's sort of like our vision for it. Like, it just seemed like a really fun time. So yeah, I, I absolutely was like interested in it because I'm like, I get to stretch my like comedy muscles a little bit more. Um, and, you know, everything I've said yes to, I've liked an aspect of or have been drawn to an aspect of from not just TV, but comics of just like, do I like this character? Do I like this idea? Do I like working with these people? So yeah, for Scooby, I loved the comedy first aspect of it. And I just, I really loved writing the gags and writing the jokes and writing, you know, the clues and all of that stuff. So it was, it was a no brainer to say yes to. And is there any of your episodes that you would cite as a favorite? Hmm. I'm trying to think. I mean, I do like a Scooby Dooby Doo a lot just because of like the actual memories around it of like planning my wedding and then doing that, like being married. <laughs> I really liked, I'm trying to think which ones. I mean, I do really like the Scarecrow one just because I did have a lot of fun writing that very end of like being like, and that was something in the original pitch where like, what if no crime really happens? <laughs> What would they do? And so, yeah, just really like Fred being like, no, but like, but like we got to arrest them because they dressed up 
like scarecrows. They're like, yeah, but we're fine. Like we've, we've come to like a conclusion. It's like, no, you got to go to jail. <laughs> like that was, that was really fun. So I would say that that one is, and that was, I think one of the very first scripts I wrote for Be Cool. So I would say that one has a special place for me. Fair enough. Have you seen the series in its entirety? Um, I haven't seen every single episode of season two. Like I think the, the last couple I haven't seen, but I've seen the rest of it. Cause you know, you get excited. You're like, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> and it's fun. I love it. <laughs> a lot of times you hear from writers who like, they haven't even seen their episode. They just think they... <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because the, the process of doing it, like it's so long. Yeah. The writing and the voice recording, it could be two yeah. years before your mm -hmm. thing. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, not in television, television's more of like a nine month turnaround, but yeah. Well, no, even TV for animation. Cause you know, the very first, you know, Teen Titans go thing I wrote was like on TV a year and a half later. Like it was a while. Um, so like, yeah, sometimes, especially when you're freelancing, you don't know until your episode's coming out. But again, like John would like, let us all know. We're all really excited. We all sort of, you know, a lot of the peep writers who knew each other for season one, we all watched. So it was a lot of fun. Now, as you said, you, you've gone on to be head writer on other shows. What have you learned? What did you take from Be Cool and that experience to these other projects and other mm. jobs? Uh, that's a great question. You know, I think some of it is, you know, that spirit of collaboration of like, even on a show that was a freelance show and was very much not geared, like was not set up to have so much collaboration, just the, the fact that having people together in a room throwing jokes back and forth just made it so much more easy and so much more enjoyable um, was a big thing. And so it's something that, you know, I've tried moving forward on every show I, I work on to like have everybody interact as much as possible to have that writer's room. Um, and so, you know, like uh, do what like, we couldn't do on, on Be Cool, which is, you know, invite the artists into the writer's room, have the writers watch the animatics, like make sure that the collaboration that just the writers were having and then like Marley and Michael and like John were having with the like directors is like a broader experience for everybody. And then, yeah, I think I think the other thing was just that you it's it goes along with the saying yes to things say yes to things that seem like they're going to be great and fun and say yes to things that you are attracted to that you think have something really special about them so that was yeah be cool was was, was a fun one to be my scooby-doo do you think there's a an interest among creatives to be more involved in that pipeline mm. as it's going along or I think I think so. I mean it's 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 always hard to tell cuz like you know animation has a little bit more forms like you know you have like you know it tends to be more 11 minute those like board driven shows but like I do think that there is a push with especially like having writers rooms to have you know writers and artists meet to have people know about things cuz it also makes it easier when you're running your own show of like TV, live action TV would do this where, and you know, I had done some assistant work in that too, where it, there's a very clear pipeline because ultimately their goal is like you as a writer move up and learn how to run your own show. And I think that what we're seeing in animation now is people coming together because we want that. We want to have that sort of like ladder. We want to have the ability to collaborate with each other because it makes the show stronger. It makes the creative parts more fun and better like I think just this push to be a lot more collaborative and to have all of the disparate like spheres actually meet and be in the same room be in the same building is like a really big one now and it's it's one that I fully support I'm I absolutely think the shows come out better when everybody can get in a room together and be like here's my favorite thing about Scooby-Doo here's my favorite thing you know when you go back and either revisit or, or just your first experience of seeing the episodes once they completed production, mm -hmm. was there anything in there that surprised you? Anything added by a board artist or mm. anything that was slipped in by the story editor or something <laughs> you're like, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the directors do such amazing work and the boarders do such amazing work, like plussing up what we have. Like we have gags. But like, and I can't remember which episode it was, but there's like an episode with like an extended stuff falling down the stairs gag. And I can't remember season one or season two that like a director had added. I'm like, this is so funny. Like the physicality is so funny. So it's a little bit like getting a gift of, you know, I've written this script and then, you know, a year later I see it and I'm like, oh, that's great. They've added so much more to it. They've added like, you know. You know, the North Stage scenario, they've like modeled it off of like, like dumb banjo players. You've got, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this looks awesome. So yeah, it's always fun to see what the artists have like plussed and added. It's amazing sometimes just how much like a simple bit of body language or business can actually yeah. plus. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs>
So let's let's transition away from Scooby Doo. We also talked about you writing comic books. We talked about you writing other features, uh, mm-hmm. working in other bits of animation. Recently completed is a comic book series you wrote for DC, New yeah. Champion of Shazam, with the amazing Doc Shainer on art. So what a good. gift! <laughs> it really was. <laughs> uh, the combination of your story and his art that was like one of my favorite books uh, in a long time. You both really kind of just brought it, and I'm curious. Thank you. I wasn't following a lot of what was going on in the Shazam world. I wasn't following a lot of the DC events that were sort of occurring at the time. Uh, Literally just picked it up on the strength of you and Shaner. How did that gig come about? And because it's also, it's a bridging story between what went before (laughs) and what's going on with Lazarus Planet. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just give a little bit of background there and and, and what it was like seeing those Shaner pages coming in. (laughs) God, dude, like even his like thumbnails are beautiful. It's like, (laughs) yeah, so I had, um, I, and actually there was like a fair amount of other animation writers like uh, Tim Sheridan, Jeremy Adams, a couple of other people. DC had approached to talk about maybe writing either a series or mini series or ongoing things. And like, I got a call. I had done a couple of out of out of those meetings. I had done a couple of like essentially shorts and like little series anthologies. Like I did like a Mogo and Teen Lantern story for like the Future State stuff. I had done something for Wonder Woman Black and Gold. And out of that, uh, the editor of that's been like sort of handling like you know some of the Shazam stuff gave me a call and asked if I had any interest in Mary Marvel. And I did. I love Mary Marvel. She's great. She's one of the oldest female like superhero characters we've got. She's like 80 years old. She's amazing. And so I said, absolutely. Um, And so what had happened, I think, in the comics right before that uh, Tim was writing, Billy kind of got siloed into the Rock of Eternity and kind of was stuck there and trapped there because he had like his own sort of mission going on. So there wasn't really a Shazam for like a year and a half or so in D.C., So the idea was that Mary would take over the mantle and that's kind of it. They're like, Mary takes over the mantle. Billy's not here. Do you have a pitch? So I I came in with like sort of my bigger pitch with like a lot of the characters I'd want to use or like reuse and they really liked it. So yeah, so I started writing this four issue mini series that was focused on not just Mary and like the mystery of like her family is going and her taking over the mantle, but like Mary as a character, like the idea was launch her in a way that she can be her own hero, even if if slash when, because it was like unclear at the time, Billy comes back, you know, she is still her own person. And then while I was writing it, um, originally Brittany was, we weren't sure who's going to draw it. Brittany, our editor, had approached Doc to be like, hey, do you want to do a cover? Here's like sort of some of the material. And then he read it. He's like, I want to do the series. And she was like, is that okay? I was like, yeah, hell yes, it's okay. Uh, and yeah, it was so funny because, you know, his his daughter was a Shira fan. She had like other things that I had worked on. And she was like, you say yes to this project. And then he read Back my pages. Back to that pages. theme of saying yes. Back to the theme of saying yes. And then he read my pages and he really, really liked them. He's like, I love this. I love how human she is. And so it was, I think, the like a fun collaboration, but also like a really great gift that truly, like, I think one of one of the best working comic book artists, period, but absolutely one of the best artists who like gets that Silver Age tone, man, like came on to like pair with me on this project because he loved the idea and he loved the way I was writing her. So that was really fun and really special. And yeah, and that has now spun into, so the idea with the miniseries was, even if you don't know what's going on in the Shazam stuff before, you can pick it up. And then at the very end of it spins into Lazarus Planet and is also spinning into Revenge of the Gods. So Lazarus Planet, I wrote a little Mary freeing Billy from the Rock of Eternity story. And then I'm writing the backups in Wonder Woman uh, 787, 789. I'd have to actually look. But the two Wonder Woman stories that are part of Revenge of the Gods, which is G. Willow Wilson's big event. I'm writing Mary in those as well. And Billy is involved in Revenge of the Gods. So <laughs> it's good of you to qualify that it is more or less a self-contained story because I did present yes. it as like this bridging thing. But yeah, <laughs> you can literally come in an issue one yeah. and issue four hints to this continues in whatever, yes. but it is four issue story. Yes. Yeah. Open yeah, and wh- shut more or less. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I love uh <laughs> You know, hearing Shaner saying that he found the Mary being very human, and that's something that I was really attracted to too, because 
she was a very genuine young woman that like her focus and her interests and her needs all seemed to be, you know, very realistic for who she was and where she was in her life. She wasn't just the hero who was happy about everything. Mm. Like she was, she's yeah. not thrilled about yeah. <laughs> kind of the situation that she was thrown into. And there's, yeah. there's some, some tough scenes in there where she, yeah. she says some things that hurt some people's feelings. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's just, because a lot of the Shazam stuff tends to have that very silver agey, you know, yeah. just bubbly and happy and yeah. talking tigers and whatever. And so having having Shayner's sort of silver agey but modern art, having yeah. your very realistic approach to this character and just being this very genuine young woman, and then also just having like a fun story and all yeah. the, the action and the whatever, like it, it was just a joy, Josie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, yeah. And I have and to you, ask you. I have uh, to ask you. There's a scene. Uh-huh. Okay, this is going to be a spoiler for anybody who wants to tune out for like 15 or 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. There's a character in the story who is... Actually, maybe this isn't a spoiler. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a character in the story, uh, a professor at the school that mm-hmm. Mary is going to named Georgina Savannah. And I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading. And at some point, somebody refers to her as Georgia. And I was like, mm-hmm. wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Savannah, yeah, Georgia? G. <laughs> is that a, is that a deliberate pun or was that accidental? <laughs> no, so it's um Georgia Savannah is an old Mary Marvel villain. She's okay. the she's the doc. So that's the thing is like so much of what I was doing was you know some some things were new like the magic tech was new. The villain Babel who says the worst things everybody's saying about you that's new. That's somebody I invented. But uh, Georgia Doc G is a real character from the Silver Age. And I think, you know, I, Autobinder loved a pun, so maybe. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, her, uh, my version of Chain Lightning is a rework of villains, again, from Mary Marvel's short-lived individual series uh, back in the Silver Age, um, Disaster Master, Hoppy. Uh, I'm, I'm just, it's all spoilers now. Uh, Uncle Marvel's there, <laughs> Uncle Marv, all spoilers. Uh, but yeah, a lot of it was me taking things from the gold or for the silver age and, and from like, again, Mary's very short run comic of her own series um, and being like, well, I'm writing a slightly more realistic grounded character. So what's the slightly more realistic, scary grounded characters of these people? And uh, I really, I really loved writing Savannah. Uh, just, you know, if you've read the Shazam stuff going forward, it's sort of fun because you've seen her father mess things up for them but like even on her own of just like that that scene of you know her like holding up (laughs) her staff at gunpoint to steal all of the like gates of ishtar stuff is fun like she's just a fun character to write i did not know that i clearly do not know enough of my history (laughs) my captain marvel history yeah don't worry about it man there's a (laughs) there's 80 years of it Did you feel, I mean, I hate the fact that this is even a part of the conversation, but when, mm-hmm. when you think about comic books mm-hmm. and you think about representation in comic books, mm-hmm. um, did you feel any kind of pressure or, or gravity mm-hmm. to taking this character who was essentially taking the place of the male version of the, the yeah. character that she's like representing, even though she's been around for 80 years, she's been yeah. there since day you know, one, yeah. day one. You, you see in other media, a lot of people, the wokeism and, oh, why did you have to gender swap and this and that mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Did that factor in at all? Or mm-hmm. were you just like, I'm just writing a good story? <laughs> I mean, you know, the the intent was like, I'm just writing a good story because, again, like you said, Mary Marvel's been around this whole time. Mary's been around this whole time. Like, the only thing that's new is that she's calling herself Shazam, which in and of itself is kind of new since the new 52, because uh, it was Captain Marvel. There is, you know, I am a woman working in animation and comics, which tend to be male dominated fields. So like, there's always part of me that is very aware that there are people out there who are just, you know, basically upset that they see diversity on screen. There are people who are upset that a woman's writing things. There's, you know, there's always going to be people there's, I mean, basically, there's always going to be people who like, just don't like anything that's not exactly what they have seen before. But like, to be a creative person, you just kind of have to put that aside. Like, don't look on Twitter. (laughs) But like, (laughs) for sure, like, you know, I when I was diving into it, I was like, you know, my attitude was like, well, I am a fan. 
So I want to write something that is both true to my voice as a writer, but also like something that I think a fan of Mary would like, but also somebody brand new to Mary would like, which is like sort of a big thing to, to juggle. But that was my focus. And I think the nice thing specifically about this is like, you know, I had so many people coming out of the woodworks being like, I am the biggest Mary fan. And I love this series or being like, I like introduced my kid to this series and they're eight and they love it. And they want to be a writer now. Like there's, there was nothing but like an outpouring of love when the actual book came out. And I think that is a true testament to like what fandom is and like what the fans are, which is like this group of people who was like, oh, this is, Poppy's here. Oh my God, this is amazing. I love the bunny. Like they're just people who wanted a good story and, you know, enjoyed what I put down. And they are now being like, more Mary, please. Like, I love this. More Shazam, please. I love this world. So that, yeah, so you know, you always have that, I, you know, you know, in the back of your mind that there are going to always be people who are going to be like naysayers, but you put them out and you write the story that you want to write and the story that you hope people respond to. I love the fact that it wasn't until honestly, I finished reading the story that I started thinking about the elements of the story and mm. how they may be perceived and how topical mm. it is. Because yeah. the, the story does feature people experiencing houselessness. Yeah. And yeah. those people being taken advantage of. Yeah. And yeah. Mary taking over from Billy. And yeah. I was kind of like, oh, yeah, I suppose some of these things could be like a flashpoint for mm-hmm. more curmudgeonly fans <laughs> out there. Uh, but I didn't see anything on social media. Yeah. Like you said, I, all I saw was kind of an outpouring of love. Yeah. Did you see any of that at all? Or I mean, I, I saw uh, the outpouring of love I definitely saw. Um, and I think the thing that is nice is like people were e- excited to see those elements there of like, you know, seeing Mary, because I was telling such a grounded story, um, I, I was like, I can't shy away from things like, here's the whole episode where she's got basically like online trolls coming after her. Here's the whole episode. Here's the, here's, it's the same issue where we're talking about the unhoused population, which like is actually the, so I made up the name of it, but the PATCO really did have throughout a lot of the pandemic, a uh, permanent tent city in the underground in Philadelphia. Like I, you know, I sent doc pictures from it of just being like, this is, this is what it was until the police came and cleared it out. So it was definitely something where I wanted it to reflect the world around it. But again, like I was trying to like, make sure that what comes through though, is like, you know, Mary's grit, her spirit, And that even though she's facing trolls or she's facing this, it's not defining her. That she's I actually forgot about the internet troll part of it, which Yeah, yeah. So which is funny. I mean, you know is even more calling it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, like, you know, I worked on she like, I've seen internet trolls going crazy before. But like, like I said, with this, people really dug what we were doing. And that was, I think that the greatest gift of all is just that so many people are either like, I love Mary, I haven't seen her so long. This is the definitive run for me. Or I just introduced Mary to my kids or my friends, and they love her. And like, now we want more like that's the the fan stuff that I've almost exclusively mainly been seeing and that's the stuff that really warms my heart as a writer how much research do you do you mentioned the 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 camps Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and sending the the reference stuff how much research do you do for something like this compared Mm -hmm. to something like be cool compared Mm -hmm. to something like the next project that we're going to be talking about (laughs) yeah so for for Mary, I did a little bit more research. Like Be Cool is less research based because like we're coming up with the gags, we're coming up with the like ghosts, we're coming up with the ideas. So it's it's more of like an ex, a, 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 an exercise in creativity for this because I you know I knew that the Shazam family is based in Philadelphia and I wanted to tell a more human realistic story. Like I did a little bit more research of just like what you know, like I sent like some reference pictures of like, this is sort of the area I'm thinking about when I'm saying like this campus is by the highway. But for the most part, because um, you're, you're West Coast, and you're writing about Philadelphia, West Coast, but uh, you know, my brother uh, went to school at Drexel. So I know oh. Philly pretty well. So and then my editors from Philly. So between us, so I did a little bit of research in the between me visiting my brother and my editor, like we felt like we could build a world that seems real, uh, because it is based on the real world. So so a little bit more research than Scooby-Doo, not as much research as I think the next project you're going to talk about. 
which I'm guessing is Legion. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. Legion of Superheroes, which just came out from Warner Animation two weeks ago, three weeks ago? Yeah, two As or three of this weeks recording. ago. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like the 7th. I think it was the 7th, yes. I think it was February the 7th, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. Now, I know Jim Krieg. Mm -hmm. To know Jim Krieg's bona fides as far as the Legion is concerned, all you have to do is watch the bonus features and see the <laughs> Matter Eater Lad. Yeah. Um, we know Jim is deep in it. Uh, Jim loves it, yeah. I've heard that you have also loved the Legion. Were you previously a Legion fan and you took a deeper dive or yeah. did they get brought to you through yeah. Jim in this project? So I was previously a Legion fan and did a deeper dive because you know Jim had called me up and he's like, hey, want to do like a, a movie about basically like Supergirl and Brainiac 5 and the Legion. Would you be interested? And I was like, I would love to do it. Let me tell you all about Vril Docs. And I read all of Rebels and the Legion when it was like L-E-G-I-O-N. The like, and, I was, yeah. and he was like, you don't need to tell me this much stuff. You've got the job. <laughs> but yeah, so like I had, I had known the Legion beforehand and you know, I really do. I love them. I think I've said another interview is like, they're just, they're so fun because they're so weird and different. Like every power is like the most creative, weirdest power you could possibly think of. And the fact that they had their rule of like, no two powers are the same, I loved. But yeah, for this project, I did a deeper dive because I was, again, a little bit like uh, Mary, I was trying to do a DVD where it, we have the Legion of Superheroes because there are Legion, a lot of Legion fans, but like also an introduction to the whole idea. Because uh, there's just so many Legionnaires, there's there's no way to get every single one of them in 70 minutes. So it was like I there's like through. at least 30 regular characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and everybody has a favorite. So I um, and you know I I it was I you know the original title was like Supergirl and the Legion. It was also like servicing Supergirl too. So I did like sort of a deep dive where I grabbed every single omnibus from like the Golden Age to like the modern times of legion stuff and kind of read through it and and tried my best to like make the movie feel a little bit like greatest hits of like here's legion academy here's you see saturn girl out there here's chemical king and like uh here in you know uh timber wolf here's uh the legion vault here's a point where like brainiac 5 has to use his like mind powers to like say the minds in his brain to save the day um so i did a, di a lot deeper dive to try to pull out characters from each era and incorporate them into something slightly new that still read as Legion, but could kind of stand alone. And if you'd never seen or heard of Legion of Superheroes, well, now you've got a primer and now you're interested in who they are. I'm curious about your choice of characters. I mean, there's there's the, the Trinity, which is yeah. Cosmic Boy, Saturn Girl, and Lightning Lad. We see them primarily as holographic statues through most yeah. of the film. yeah. And we focus on other characters as far as the more responsible in charge legionnaires are. Mm. Is that because the focus was on the Academy or mm. and maybe having the Trinity there mm. by virtue of them being there would demand that they be the stars of the, mm. the movie? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was sort of more focused on the Academy and I was kind of deliberately picking some of the weirder or like more disparate sort of versions of characters, like in pulling them in. I, I love the Trinity, but like they're the focus of a lot of stuff. Like it's it's kind of a lot of ways with this movie, I was like, let's try to do things a little bit differently. So instead of it's, instead of, you know, Superboy coming to Legion, it's Supergirl. She has her own history with the Legion, but like, you know, having her be the entry point, um, you know, instead of Saturn Girl and the others being the focus, because they're always the focus, Let's pull in some other characters. Let's see, you know, Triplicate Girl. Let's see Bouncing Boy coming in. Um, some of it was, I, I really love a lot of Cochrane characters, which is Timberwolf. So I kind of pulled those in. And then some of it was, yeah, trying to trying to focus on the idea that here's this Legion Academy. So instead of like the polished people who are good at this, here are the people who are like a little bit the also rans. Here's Arms Fall Off Boy. <laughs> like he's here. Is he a hero? And that like, you know, fits in with the message of a little bit being a fish out of water that, you know, Supergirl is dealing with uh, and living up to a legacy the way sort of like both her and Brainiac 5 are both living up to. So the, the short version is the trinity of the leaders of Legion are in just so much Legion stuff that I wanted to sort of scoot the camera around them and sort of see some of the other Legionnaires and play with them and see, you know, what they bring to the 
the forefront in terms of the story of basically like alienation and finding a place to belong. And kind of the theme of the film is it is kind of about embracing sort of the weirdos. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. <laughs> so that really fit. Yeah, um, like Lightning Lad's powers make a lot more sense than like Prody and, <laughs> and Arms Fall Off Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, uh, I knew Supergirl was going to be in this. Mm-hmm. I, at the risk of sounding marginally negative i haven't been a huge <laughs> fan of the what's being called the tomorrowverse films mm-hmm. uh, i've enjoyed them but i haven't loved them so going into this one i was like i'm i love the legion i like your writing i loved new champion of shazam so it's kind of like fingers crossed that this is going to be like the one and then i thought oh they're going to focus too much on supergirl because she's like it's like throwing batman and everything you know you do a justice league dark movie but you throw batman in there because that's the character everybody knows and it ends up being more of a Batman movie than anything else. This is like one of my top three Supergirls. I love this Kara so much. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad. (laughs) She was a joy to be in this movie. And uh, I mean, I don't know what a lot of other people think, but literally when the movie ended, like I tweeted, I love this Kara. I want more of this Kara. She's so genuine and she's so kind of... Yeah young and real and and you, the relationship between Brainy and Supergirl like you said Supergirl has a history with the Legion for anybody who doesn't know Brainiac 5 and Supergirl do have a romantic connection yeah. in the history of the the comic books and I wondered if that would play into here and it does play into here and how Brainy's not a physical guy Brainy's a 12th no. level intelligence and Supergirl you know she's smart yeah she's not like I'm yeah, gonna sit down and same. think this problem yeah. out she she's got the fists yeah. right and yeah The way you play with that, one of my favorite scenes is when they're flying and Brainy says like, this is, this is embarrassing. And she's like, I could fly upside down if you want. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) It was just such a great dynamic. And Mm -hmm. what, what was your in with this, Mm -hmm. with this Supergirl? What were you trying to Mm -hmm. harken back to or evoke or bring forward coming at this? And also uh, I keep piling like six questions into one. (laughs) the dangers of Supergirl possibly Mm. overtaking other characters Mm. and how you balance that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I knew that Supergirl was like, you know, the protagonist and the through line for this whole thing. So for me, for Supergirl, my goal with her was, I mean, it's not that different from Mary of like finding a little bit more humanity in her and finding that thing that like, makes you go, oh, I want her to be my friend too. And, you know, for me, like, and I think I've said this in other interviews too, of like Superman is the immigrant story, but Supergirl's the refugee story. Like she literally watched her whole planet blow up in front of her. Like her whole life, her family, everything is gone in a blink of an eye. And yet she still, when she shows up on earth and also finds out her cousin's now older than her, like she still is like, well, I've got these powers. I still want to do good with them. So it was like playing that reality of, yeah, like everything is up and topsy-turvy for her. This world doesn't make any sense to her. Batman's kind of being a dick. <laughs> like Not enough robots in this world. Not enough robots in this world. And then it, that meant it was pretty seamless that then being like, well, obviously the place she really does belong is the 31st century. And then that goes into, I think the most fun that I had was writing her in Brainiac 5 because I love that dynamic of like, he's all intellect and she's mostly brawn. So like when they're at odds with each other, they're pretty evenly matched, but like they're at odds, but when they work together and come together, that's when they're able to save the day. Uh, And it's, you know, it's always fun. I love writing characters that are like such complete opposites. Um, And I, I, I love that that's what attracts them to each other is that like, he likes that she's strong. She likes that he's smart. They're maybe being a little snide to each other, but they they do like each other. So yeah, so for this, uh, I knew Kara was the forefront, but that what everything in Act 1 was building to was like, she's going to go to the 31st century and we're going to find where she belongs. And not only that, she's going to see the person that reminds her most of herself in Brainiac 5. Not right away, but they will find each other. And then as for balancing everybody, like, man... 70 minutes is not a lot of time for a movie. So like, you know, I was definitely like, I wanted you to, the little bit that you get of every other Legionnaire, I wanted you to love them as much as you loved Kara. 
And it was so fun to me to write that final scene where like their powers are all working together, you know, like Dawn stars grabbing Phantom Girl and they're phasing through and then she's dropping them on mon Like they're all working together, which is really fun. Like this is absolutely a world that like I would love to write like a sequel that has a lot more Legionnaires in it. Because, like, in some ways, the tome has felt like we're setting up for, like, maybe there could be some more stuff. Like, I know there's more tomorrow stuff that's it's different, but, like, I would love to write another movie with all of these characters and get even more Legion stuff in, you know? <laughs> the other thing I was worried about was, again, bringing in Supergirl. Mm-hmm. She has yet to be, or she had yet to be introduced yes. in this iteration of, of, of the DC narrative. Yeah. So not only were you servicing introducing the Legion of Superheroes, which is an enormous concept, <laughs> yeah. and like we already said, like thirty plus like regular characters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you also had to introduce Kara and and yeah. give her an origin story of sorts, yeah. and it was it was managed quite deftly. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think once I hit upon the idea that like here's this fish out of water thing, it kind of all came together because you know here's the Legion. They're kind of a bunch of weirdos with strange powers. Here's Kara. Her her backstory is kind of wild of just like oh yeah, she was Superman's older cousin, but then went herring off the rails, and now he's older than her. But now they're cousins, and now she's here. She also has her own wildness and like weird story. So yeah, the the trying to like balance that like in so, in so many ways, I'm like, okay, well, this is what Kara is going through, so she can get to the Legion and find that home. So that was that was sort of always my focus of just being like, all right, everything that Kara is doing at the end of the day, it's because she's searching for a new home, and I want the audience to feel like not only does she find it in the Legion, that they find it in the Legion, and that they would love to see even more. So. Considering, I don't know when production on this started, mm-hmm. when you started writing it, but a couple years ago, Brian Michael Bendis, famously or infamously, depending on your position, your point of view. Uh, relaunched Legion of Superheroes mm-hmm. as part of his whole big Superman initiative. Yeah. Apparently his whole taking over Superman was so that he could relaunch Legion of Superheroes. <laughs> um, and there's also a Legion of Superheroes show animated series yes. in development yes. based mm-hmm. on those Brian Michael Bendis yes. Or based on that Brian that Michael Bendis version, iteration. Yeah, yeah. So here we have this Tomorrowverse Legion and we yes. have this other Legion kind of in yeah. the wings. How much of that was floating mm-hmm. around? How much did that influence your approach yeah. and limitations so, that might have put on you? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, the nice thing about the, the Tomorrowverse stuff is that they're standalone DVDs. So they don't really have to intersect with the rest of the stuff. Like the stuff with the... Uh, Bendis's Legion that's moving into animation is like newer. Like I wrote, I wrote this story before all that stuff was happening. And like Bendis had just taken over Legion. So I hadn't really read anything. So like it really was like me being like, okay, clear plate, like what things am I going to throw in that makes it feel different from what's going on in the other stuff. And, you know, I'll, I'll admit I haven't read very much of the Bendis stuff, but like, you know, al- along those lines of like, it, it, again, I'm like trying to get away from the Trinity, trying to trying to do some, some different weirder things, trying to pull on some of the stuff that I remember from Legion from honestly the 90s. That was sort of my focus. Um, it's cool that there's a, there's a focus on them now. Like I loved the James Tucker 2000s. Oh. That was yes! so amazing. I've watched oh. that series like three or four times all the way through. It's like a it's comfort food when I'm yeah, when yeah. I need to be lifted up. I just throw an episode on. And like I I know like sometimes it can alienate people, but I love that art style too because it's just there's just such a cool thing happening at that time of like just trying different things. Like it's really great. So yeah, so I I was not going out of my way to find Legion stuff other than like, like published comics that I was like looking at. Mainly, again, I was just trying to pull things from like every era that I could to be like, okay, people you're not, you actually would be surprised to see in Legion movie, but they are part of this Legion history. That's, that's sort of my focus. But yeah, it's, it's, it's cool that there's so much Legion stuff going on, man. <laughs> Long live the Legion. <laughs> uh, which Legion is your Legion? I came in with five years later, which people tell mm. me is like the most insane place to start. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a huge, I was a huge Keith Giffen fan going yes. in. Mm-hmm. So I was invested for, for Keith's. Yeah plots and his art yeah but i just got addicted to figuring out who all these people were and what this world was. (laughs) yeah yeah because they weren't even going by code names no one said cosmic boy people called him rock right (laughs) which is like the most obtuse version (laughs) of the legion but yeah no i was a big i was a giffen fan um i mean it's why i grabbed the dark circle to use in this is i remember seeing as a kid the cover uh at my local cvs with like all the everybody with like dark circle masks on them and i'm being like chilled 
So like, like the Giffen stuff, yeah. It's like issue 17 or 18 or something of that run. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the Giffen stuff for about. sure. Yeah, the Giffen stuff. And then I think I mentioned again, I really liked Rebels. I really liked Legion when it was the acronym Legion. Like I really love the Kolu and Brainiac family stuff a lot. Like Brainiac, like all of the Brainiacs are fun. So, you know, which is also another thing that I was like trying to bring in is just like, you've got this whole insane family of evil clones. And then Brainiac 5 is like sitting here being like, no, but like, guys, let me be a hero. <laughs> Listening to Timberwolf listing off the previous four Brainiacs was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this one was a straight up serial killer. <laughs> this one, this is, just throw them out. Just throw them all out. <laughs> as far as... Mm-hmm. I guess referencing the Bendis stuff again, when Bendis came in, Bendis really leaned into the diversity. He really wanted to expand yeah. the Legion to represent yeah. a lot of different like races, genders, people. stuff. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and I noticed some of that carries over into your Legion of Superheroes yeah. film. And I was wondering how much of that came from you as a writer and how much of that was maybe just in the design stage. Because mm. the writing itself doesn't call out any of the diversity. Like nobody's sitting there and being um, like... I, I did a little bit because like there's specific, you know, the specific version of Invisible Kid I wanted to grab with Jacques. So like, you know, I, I did call out some of the people that I was like, it's this version, it's this person, you know, it's Dawn Star who is Native American. That is just who she is. So some of it was picking people who I knew were more diverse. And some of it is, yeah, you know, um, because of the Bendis stuff, you know, we've got a more diverse Legion period. So some of those designs reflected that. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing is everybody at Warner Brothers like wants to make movies that everybody wants to watch. So, you know, some of the some of the changes were me, some of the changes were in the design, some of the changes were already in the air because of what was going on at DC. But like all of it, I think supported this idea of like fish out of water, finding the place where you belong, that we're all different, that we're all different people. We come from all different walks of life, but we find those connections with each other. Yeah, even when we're like a bunch of weirdos, we find those connections with each other and that's what makes us stronger. So it just felt like it supported the Legion so clearly of like, here's this group of people who are all different, but when they come together, they're greater than just the, the, the all of them together is greater than one individual. It just felt like it, it made sense. It goes along with that whole ethos and idea. It's great to see, because uh, like with the Legion, I mean, historically, when issues of diversity have come up, there have been people who have said, you know, mm. oh, but there's orange characters. It's not it's not just this whitewashed <laughs> cast of whatever. And it's like, yeah, you're not getting yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it was good to see. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously, mm-hmm. you enjoy doing this. Mm-hmm. You've kind of intimated that you have a desire to continue if possible. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Are there rumblings? Is there any chance of any more Kara and the Legion from you? Is there anything that you can say? <laughs> I would love to do more Kara and the Legion. I have you have you heard the response to the film? Does Warner Brothers have figures? So, do we know if it's a success? So that's the thing that's so hard with this is like it, you know, it's it's doing well. You know, it was the top number one like release for like a week or so for like action adventure DVDs on Amazon. Like it's do it's people seem to be enjoying it. I have no because I'm just the writer, I have absolutely no control over if more happens with it. You need a t-shirt uh, that says, I'm I just need, the writer. I'm just the writer. That's a, that's a question for David Zaslav and uh, <laughs> the people running Warner Brothers. I just know I would love to write more. And if if not this, just Cara in general. I just love her so much. So I would say, yeah. And then, yeah, if you want to see more stuff from me, and I, it's it's been so long in coming, but it is happening. My Adventure of the Superman is coming out this year. So stay tuned for announcements for that. I am working on, like I said, um, the backup issues for Wonder Woman for this Revenge of the Gods event that's taking place and is going to be coming out in the next month or so. Uh, So if you want more of that, stay tuned. And then, yeah, I've got a couple of projects in development and like a couple of things, maybe more in the comic sphere that I'm talking about. Uh, Nothing firm as of yet, but definitely there's going to be absolutely more stuff coming from me this year. So stay tuned. And if you liked the the Mary Marvel stuff or your trade waiting, the hardcover edition comes out May 9th, which has just, I'm so excited. Like I have all the, the issues and I have every iteration of like Doc's art and I'm still like, I need more of it <laughs> in my life. So yeah, if you really enjoyed that or if you were like, we're waiting on it. Yeah, May 9th, it's coming out. I think it's got all of the variant covers in it as well. It's just going to be a gorgeous book. And just to 
Just to end on a Scooby note, you've probably been asked this question before. Franchise has been around for 53 years now as, as of this recording. A lot of theories, a lot of opinions on why it's lasted this long. I'm mm. curious, having spent a little time in the sandbox yourself, what do you think <laughs> can be credited with their longevity? You know, it's so funny because I actually have been thinking about this as we're talking that is a little bit like Legion. I think some of the credit to the longevity is that it's strange. It's a hungry man and his talking dog and his best friends are in a van and they're solving mysteries that all, every single criminal is like, I'm not just going to be a counterfeiter. I'm going to be a counterfeiter who pretends to be a mutant from outer space to scare. Like it's, it's odd. It's an odd thing, but like, because it's so odd, it's fun. It's funny. Like you like Scooby-Doo because, like, and you know, the original Scooby-Doo is legitimately a really good comedy. Like I saw people sharing this a while ago, but like, there's a like, great, like basically haircut scene in it where they're like uh, the, the original Scooby-Doo where Scooby and Shaggy are hiding. They lock a door and throw the key out the window and they're hiding. And then the camera pans and a different door opens behind them and the monster comes in. And so they're like, shit, we got to get out of here. So they run, jump out the window, grab the key, jump back in the window, unlock the door and run out. And it's like, this is hilarious. This is so funny. So yeah, I would say I think the, the reason it's stuck around is it's so different. It's so strange and odd and funny that like it's stuck in everybody's mind because then you're like, yeah, I want to see more of the hungry man, his dog and the mysteries. I want to see this. This is great. <laughs> I feel like there should be a series called Hungry Man and His Dog and the Mysteries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or like this is like a punk band name or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Josie, thank you so much for yes. spending all of this time with me talking about Scooby yeah. and your other projects. Is there any social media where you want people to find you? Yeah. You, so you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Cozy Jamble. I also, I just snapped up that handle everywhere. So my website is also CozyJamble.com. Uh, and there you can find a listing of like all the stuff that's coming out for me this year and updates and things like when I do events and stuff like that. The things that are definitely coming out, definitely keep an eye out for my adventures with Superman, which is a lot of fun, a lot of Superman stuff. Uh, and keep an eye out for the trade and keep an eye out for Revenge of the Gods. That's definitely all coming coming out uh, this year. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah, if you find Cozy Jamble, you find me. <laughs> All right, uh, everybody, pick up that stuff. Legion of Superheroes is out on Blu-ray 4K and digital. Mary Marvel hardcover coming out. Single issues floating around if you can still find them at your local comic store. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. This has been yeah. great. No, this has been a lot of fun. So yeah. I maybe get you back to do an audio commentary or something sometime. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. You have a good one. You too. And there you have it. That was my conversation with writer Josie Campbell. I hope you all enjoyed that little behind the scenes peek into the production of Be Cool Scooby-Doo and some of Josie's other projects. If you're curious about her other work, I'd recommend checking out the stuff mentioned in the convo, like her new Champion of Shazam and Legion movie, but it's definitely also worth checking out her creator-owned series at Boom Studios, I Heart Skull Crusher, as well as the My Adventures of Superman show and comic book. All fun stuff. You can also follow Josie on Twitter at Cozy Jamble and on Blue Sky at CozyJamble.bsky.social to stay abreast of Josie's projects and goings on. As for me, you can contact me through any of the show's socials at Scooby Doo Cast on Twitter, a podcast named Scooby Doo on Insta or on Facebook, YouTube, or at ScoobyPodcast at gmail.com. As for what's coming up next for APNSD, I'm honestly not really sure. This interview completes the three conversations that I had been sitting on that I promised to release during this year. And though I do have one more chat that is currently being discussed slash scheduled, I'm not sure exactly when that's coming out or what's coming after that. So it's kind of a wait and see thing, I guess. One thing I can say is that when I do know, you'll know. Stay tuned to the socials and when there is an announcement to go out, that is where you'll see it. Until that time, I want to thank everyone again for their continued support and for checking this episode out. I hope everyone stays safe, stays well, and we will see you next time on a podcast named Scooby-Doo. everybody cheer! This is how we solve the Solve the mystery. So in summation, this narration is my donation to the art of mystery solving dictation.
vacation. And here's what the bad guys say when they play where the law forbids. Would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids. This is how we solve the mystery. Bye.